Welcome to Down the Road. I know it's cold out there. You know it's cold out there. So let's not worry about whether or not it's cold out there. You're inside. You're where the TV is. We're going to bring up some hot topics. A little bit later in the show, we'll talk about Woodrow Wilson. Uh, get that. Woodrow Wilson. Uh, he was president at the time of the last pandemic. It'll be interesting to get a perspective from someone that's an expert when it comes to Woodrow Wilson. But there's a lot of things happening nationally and locally uh, when it comes to policy and it comes to decisions. And so I asked a friend to come in, and that's former House Majority Leader Al Carlson from the North Dakota House. Al, good to have you back coming down the road with us. You know what? My car started and I made it. But yeah, I've got an app on my phone. And I'm sitting there uh, cutting ads on the radio station, right? And I'm like, oh, better start the car. I hit it, wouldn't start. And I thought, oh, come on. You're almost, I mean, so I, uh, uh, I went outside, started right up. Yeah. So don't trust the app, is yeah. my point. Well, you see, the technology got you again. Well, it's if a new, you, you know, it's pretty nice for you to say it's a new Chevy outside that you drove up in. Yeah, well, that's the second one. The first one kind of died. So. <laughs> <laughs> Wanted to get a chance. So that's not the best ad right there for yeah, that. No, no, well, I, we want to talk where I got it. I don't think this time of year matters too much, whether you're a Chevy, a Dodge, a Ford, whatever. Uh, they're all tough going. You bet. And those are people that have their cars outdoors. You know, oh. you just better start it every once in a while or it's not going to go. I've got a young newsman that we, we hired and brought on. And he, he says, yeah, I left my car outside. It wouldn't start this morning. I said, what do you mean you left your car outside? Yeah. Yeah, I didn't put it in the garage. <laughs> like, do you like your car? <laughs> do you, do you, so, do you want to get to work on time, keep your job? There's a reason 22-year-olds yeah. make mistakes like yeah, that. You bet. Want to get a chance to visit with you a little bit about what's happening out at the state legislature. Um, you know, I've been talking as a talk show host and others about some of the ridiculous bills that are in. But you and I both know the process well enough to know that some of that gets filtered out. By, by crossover, some of the idiotic bills are gone. Absolutely. And, you know, everybody panics uh, that doesn't understand the system. But you and I both know that I could probably convince enough of my friends to pass a bad idea in the House, but it isn't going to fly in the <laughs> Senate. And the same thing goes in the Senate and the House. Uh, they're always the ones that make the news. I mean, these guys' job is to make sure that they balance the budget, that they uh, try and make sure the government's efficient and is supplying the needs of the people. And when they get beyond that, it usually gets them in trouble. So in our time in the legislature, we had a number of governors, and it wasn't our job to get along with governors. Fair? Absolutely. Okay. We're, we're a separate branch of government. If we do, that's great. We hope they think like we think. All right. But, but my point is you can dislike somebody's policies or money-wise, but you don't have to dislike them personally. And, and so that's one example I would give. But uh, when I look at, at this governor, Governor Burgum, I have to say I've never seen a governor that the majority party, your party, uh, isn't doing the kumbaya with more. I mean, you know, they, they, you guys don't seem to get along. Th there's been a struggle there. You know, it, it, the governor is a uh, Microsoft guy, obviously, and, and the word team and and uh, always comes up when he's talking. You know, I'm going to build the team, and my team is working on it. Well, he, he needs to make sure that his team includes the legislature. And if you don't, it's going to be tough sledding, because. If there's things that the legislature wants that he absolutely doesn't, uh, when I was leader, Jack used to walk, Dalrymple used to walk down the hall, and if he disagreed with me, he said, how are we, we going to make this work? It, it, but it helped it, that Jack served with you. Well, he the understood the legislative process, right. and he never panicked. When something dies tomorrow, every day, as long as there's another legislative day, it could be Resurrection Sunday. Yeah. You know, because that bill can come back. How, how big of a price did Governor Burgum pay when he dabbled in those local legislative races and put hundreds of thousands of money in. He, your friend Jeff Delzer, when, when you were leader, you put him in as chairman of the House Appropriations Committee. Uh, you wanted a fiscal hawk in there, yep. a watchdog, and Governor Burgum doesn't like him. I you mean, know, we can sit here and dance around it all we want. He doesn't like him. Well, those two guys are probably not going to share Christmas cards and Valentine's <laughs> cards. But the point is, Jeff is a very a powerful guy in the Appropriations Committee. Nobody understands the budget better. And he's always looking ahead. They criticize him because they say he puts money away and he's hiding money. Well, there's no money to hide in government. Everybody knows where it's at. But the point is that you need to make sure you don't outspend your resources. 
Now, you and I could get into the topic of oil taxes again, but we're not going to do that today. Well, how do you know? <laughs> <laughs> so the point is that, that there's only so much to spend, and there's got to be common ground in the end as to what you're going to spend it on. And, uh, and getting to that point, uh, hopefully I haven't heard a lot of uh, uh, thing differences between the two yet, between the governor and the legislature, but there's been no time to veto anything. You know, we, we sued him over some vetoes where he was legislating with his appropriation, his veto pen on appropriations, and we won. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that that lesson was hard to learn. It was no fun to have to do that. But the point is, you and I both will always defend the legislative branch of government. Mm -hmm. But there is some, there's a lot of fence building that has to be done, or fence mending that has to be done, because uh, obviously I don't think Jeff and Doug spend a lot of time together and you know what? They should spend a little time together once in a while talking about the end result of that budget. Do you think Governor Burgum truly understands the legislative process? You know, I think he's got a better understanding now than he did two years ago. But he still seems to think that the executive office has the authority to say yes or no to what's happening in the state. Uh, and the, actually, the board of directors sits down the hall, and there's 149 of them. And those people are, uh, are going to make the final decisions uh, as to what goes on. And hopefully they do it with the governor instead of uh, fighting the governor. Uh, the budgets, uh, we'll see how it goes. Those guys have a long ways to go. There's a lot of demands on the money this time. And I, I'm not sure how they're going to get that table leveled out, <laughs> out in the end so that they actually, uh, they're trying to cover up this groundhog, uh, you know, the prairie dog bill where they made promises to the political subdivisions and they were supposed to fill these buckets. Well, they didn't fill. And these political subdivisions, some of them made promises that they probably shouldn't have on spending on improvements, and there's not money coming for it. So they're looking at a big bonding bill to do that, and, and I don't know how that's all going to work out because there's people that like bonding and there's people that hate bonding. People that say now is the time to do it because the interest rates are so low. But on the other hand, it's encumbering future legislatures with debt. Uh, we spent years trying to get rid of our bonding debt from that it happened in the 80s and 90s. And uh, now they're headed back down that road again. I'm not sure it's the right road to go on. I personally would really be very cautious on the bonding. The governor favors it. They're at a billion dollars so far. And they'd like so, to go higher. So the legacy fund, uh, because the difference between the 80s and the 90s, when, when you and I kicked in, when we had those issues that Ed Schaefer, you know, pounded and pounded on, we didn't have a legacy fund. We didn't have $7 billion dollars in the bank. I mean, we didn't have a budget stabilization fund. Right. We, we had absolutely nothing to go to. So and that's but, why we established that. But my point is this, Al. It, it, you know, you say live up to the promises made to local political subdivisions. The money is there to make up. The, the, I realize oil revenue, we got some bad news again. Uh, you know, that oil revenue isn't where we had hoped it would have been in, in the month of December and how things backdate on some of those reports. But the, the point I'm trying to get at is we're not broke. And so why not live up to the promises we made the political subdivision? You know, you and I both know that the people put the legacy fund in place. They went to the ballot and they put in a percentage of that oil tax goes directly into the legacy fund. And also you can only take 15% of the principal out in any given year, a uh, legislative year, uh, with a two-thirds vote of the House of this and the Senate. Well, that's very difficult to do. So really you have limited amounts of money that are easy to get, and that's the interest on the legacy fund, which now is getting to be a pretty darn uh, big number. Even though interest rates are low, that's a pretty big number. The, uh, so the, why not the put question, it to work? Well, they are. And, they're, and right now, I think that the proposal that's in on the uh, bonding bill is to take 20 to 25 or 25 percent of that money, of the interest, and use it to pay the bonds every time. You know, I mean, if you're going to do it, I guess that's a logical way to do it, is that you've got a source to fund it without affecting your human services budget. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if you're going to go deeper into that and get into the principal, you're going to have to, you're going to have, to have an overwhelming support of two-thirds of your people on both sides. Now, you could tell me that, well, I can guarantee you that my seven senators will do it, or six senators, whatever it is, and that my 13 or 14 in the House will do it. Well, that leaves you a lot of Republicans that you've got to turn, especially in a very conservative crowd, to get that to get at the principal. I just don't know that you're going to get at the principal right now. Do, do we spend too much money on higher education? 
uh, the, the enrollments are down. You know, I mean, we should be able to look at enrollment numbers. That was the big incentive when we said, you know what, we'll pay you by uh, your production. We'll pay you by how many people are coming through the door, and they're down. Uh, UND's down. NDSU's down. Uh, State College of Science is down, a place that's near and dear to both of us. Um, you know, do we spend too much money on higher education? Well, I, I don't know if you can call it too much money, but I think we're probably not spending it in the right place. I mean, we're into building buildings again. And the whole face of higher education, in my opinion, has changed. You know, the day when everybody's going to be on campus are gone. You know, you turn on a TV, you can't help but hear six or seven ads in a five-hour period of online education and how cheap it is for people to get your degree. Well, look at during the pandemic what happened. More and more people didn't come to campus. More and more people went online to get their courses. So how do you bring those back? The campuses. I think that that higher ed is, is an accident waiting to happen, and we really need to take a good hard look how we fund it, and what ex we expect from it. But that's, and, that's, and that's the that, reason that, I asked the question. Thing. Yep. That's the reason I asked the question because if you or I or anybody goes in and says, "Wait a second here," you know, let's prioritize here to there. There, I mean, we need what what is produced by the North Dakota State College of Science. That's workers, right? Yep. But to sit there and say, "Well, you can have this new program, that new program." I'm not convinced that we can afford that, Al. That's well, if I were, uh, I've always tried to uh, to reorganize the trade and tech, whether it be career and uh, career ed, you know, career and bo tech. What do they call it? Bo. Well, it's bo tech. Yeah, but we we fund that as separately of the of yeah. the of the of the two year colleges. But we need to get this all under one umbrella and really target where we want our workforce to be trained. The the, the employer should be telling us what we need to train, instead of us educating people where there isn't necessarily a job for them when they're done and we need to spend our money smart well i was just up in williston and i got to tell you the job they do there the job they do at the state college of science the job they do at bismarck state are the type of jobs and i i could add devil's lake i don't know as much about that uh but the job they do produce the workers we need and that's one of the reasons that i brought it up uh, when we come back we're going to talk a little bit about what happened on a federal level we're going to talk about what heroes seven Republican United States Senators were. I'm interested to get Sal Hal's take <laughs> on that. Stick around as we go down the road. Capital City Restaurant Supply is your one-stop shop for quality restaurant products for the large to small kitchens. Commercial grade restaurant and bar supplies, limb game processing equipment, refrigeration, dinnerware, and smallware. We sell everything including the kitchen sink from trusted manufacturers for the chef and all of us. Open to the public since 1971, we are veteran owned and North Dakota proud. Let us take care of your restaurant and home kitchen needs today by visiting us at 1414 Interstate Loop in Bismarck or on the web at CapitalCityRestaurantSupply.com. Heroes and Icons is now Cozy TV. Don't worry, you'll still get your favorite Beck News programming without changing the channel. Real people, real news, Beck News. Hi, I'm Dennis Haugen, along with my sons Andy and Mike, and we're showing our support for wind energy in North Dakota. Wind energy has provided farmers like us with a steady stream of income that's not tied to the weather, like crops and cattle are. Another bonus is that wind farm owners are required to maintain the roads leading up to the turbines. Because of that, oftentimes these roads are the best in the county. Wind energy is good for landowners, it's good for the land, it's good for our economy, and it's good for North Dakota. There's nothing more important than family. And at Prairie Rose Family Dentists, we get it. That's why we have more locations, more dentists, specialists, extended hours, pediatric clinics, and even emergency appointments, so you can always be seen. Book your appointment today at prairierosedentist.com. Prairie Rose Family Dentists. We are family. Forty years ago, Aero Service Team started with one truck and lots of hard work. Times may have changed, but the hard work that we put in to get your lives back in order after fire, water, and disaster hasn't. Over the years, we've seen so many families lose their belongings due to water and fire damage. Restoring homes back to the original state has made every hour of hard work well worth it. 
Thank you for trusting our family with yours. When disaster strikes, you only have to make one call. Arrow Service Team does it all. Pub 21, your one stop for fun, drinks, and food. Our spacious facility provides COVID-safe fun for you and all your friends. With nightly bingo and specials, you can be sure there's something to do for everyone. If you're staying in for the night, we've got you covered just across the way with Pub 21 Liquor. We have a wide variety of options, from wine to whiskey and everything in between. Stop in today at 1014 South 12th Street in Bismarck to see what all the buzz is about. You won't be disappointed. Welcome back to Down the Road. Al Carlson and I have known each other for a long time. I think if people, if people truly knew what happened behind the scenes to pass legislation, I think they'd understand why we're friends. I think they'd understand uh, what we were able to accomplish together so that uh, one side wasn't uh, snipping at the other. Now, that being said, on a national scale, there was some signs of that. There was some signs of individuals that, in my opinion, did the right thing. I'm sure Al's opinion is different. Uh, but the vote was held at the impeachment trial of Donald Trump. Uh, and he was found not guilty. And he was found not guilty because, you know what, you needed 17 more votes than what the majority was. And the, the individuals that brought the case only got seven uh, from the, the minority party, I guess, now. So seven GOP members decided, you know what, Donald Trump needs to be held accountable for this attempted insurrection and this attempted coup. Uh, I wanted to get a chance to visit with Al Carlson about that. Al, seven heroes in my eyes. Seven yeah, heroes. They could be heroes in your eyes, but the, in my opinion of them is that if they, they can't win in their home state with a D in front of their name, so they put an R in front of their name. They're really not hardcore right, by any means Republicans. They, 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 they think more, and, and you watch their votes. It isn't just the impeachment of Donald Trump. It's the Supreme Court justices. It's all the different things that they'll vote for. Their votes are not, in my opinion, following in any way, shape, or form what I believe a Republican stands for. And, so, uh, and so do you believe that uh, Donald Trump played a role in that insurrection? I believe that he did not. He played a role in the fact that he is the head of the party. His language, what he said, what he did, did not bring those people to the point of, of insurrection. They were already attacking the Capitol before he even got done speaking. And they'd been planning it for weeks. Yeah, but before but, he, now wait a second, before he got done speaking, but he already said enough in the beginning to send them up there. How I many times did he say, get up Pennsylvania Avenue, get yep. to the Capitol? And he peacefully, word, it, it, he peacefully, said peacefully once. He yep. said fight double digit times. In fact, his lawyer got up there, you know, and said combat by fire. I mean, this guy was getting after it, Rudy Giuliani. He well, should Rudy, be arrested. Rudy was a little over the top, but I'll agree with that on so his So was speech. Donald Trump. Well, I, don't, I didn't see Donald as much over the top. But what bothers me more than anything is that there's, there was so much hearsay and not enough facts. I mean, let, it, let's get all these people, line every one of them up that they've arrested and find out where they came from and who they are. But, you know, that hasn't been talked about much. And most so where it, do you think they're from? You know, they're from all over the place, and they're not, they're, it's not exempt from the Antifa. Oh, come it's on. It's not exempt from Black Lives Matter. You, you're it's a pretty not a, deep guy. I mean, yeah. Black Lives Matter and Antifa are just talking points. These oh, individuals no. that have been hired have been Trump supporters. They've been, it's been proven they're Trump supporters. Not only that, I'm going to throw this at you. They are caught on video with the audio saying that the President of the United States had ordered them to come to the Capitol. They were caught saying that. That was brought forth. Come to the during, Capitol and do what? Well, come to the Capitol and do what they're doing because they were asked what they're doing in the Capitol. How, did, how, how come Nancy Pelosi and how come uh, what the, uh, Chuck Schumer, who were notified, and Mitch McConnell, asked if they need more help? People, the, the head of security at the Capitol said, we need more people. This is going to be an issue. And they turned them down both well, times. Why did they do that? We can talk about that. Al. Yeah, we can talk about that. And I, I think if they had to do that all over again, obviously they would ask for the help. But I think the answer to that, if they were sitting right here with us right now, might be we didn't know the president was going to turn that mob loose on us. Yeah. And here's the fact. They got to D.C. sponsored by the president and his supporters. In fact, 
North Dakota's Attorney General, Wayne Stangem, played a role in providing the funding to get those folks there on a bus. They got there by Mr. Pillow, right? My pillow paid for a lot of that. The president timed it so it would be on January 6th. If you were sitting here with Mike Pence right now, what do you suspect he would say? Do you think he would blame Donald Trump for this or not? I don't think he would. I don't think he'd say that he was the only cause of this by any means. Not the only. I'm not saying the only. Those people that stormed the Capitol are responsible as well. I'm asking you, a man that that was as loyal as Mike Pence, when, when Donald Trump calls him out and these people go to the Capitol and Mike's wife and his daughter are in the balcony, do you really believe that Mike Pence wouldn't say Donald Trump was part of this? You know, I don't think he would. I don't think Mike Pence would say it, and I don't think that Donald... You know, you could, it's easy to point fingers. Where was the security? You know that this crowd is going to build, and you know that there's going to be five, 600,000 people in D.C., and, and they've been asked and have been told, march to the Capitol, let your voices be heard. Let your voices be heard. And fight. They, and they were heard. you got to get down there and fight. Yeah. That was said well, double-digit times. How about Maxine Waters? How about uh, don't, don't deflect. No, Let's no, get no. to the issue how of the day. How about all the, ti- the, about all the, the times day. that she says fight? The issue of the day is whether or not the impeachment trial was found to be, be that he encouraged, supported an insurrection in this country. He incited a riot. We can talk about security. We can no, talk about know. all that. I, 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 Here's I'll the thing. Mitch McConnell has a right as a minority leader to go and request more security. He didn't do that. Mitch was as guilty as, as the and other McCarthy. Two. Had, yeah. Well, you're just mad at Mitch yeah. now because he came true on the end. Yeah, well, Mitch oh. voted. He didn't vote to impeach the president. Yeah, but he sure got after him. He blamed the president yeah. of the United States. The reason that he didn't vote to impeach him, he said, was because he wasn't president anymore. Yeah. That's what he said. Well, and I, and Mitch if you read McConnell, the Constitution, that, does, that document does mean he's something. He's the one that held the trial away until after the, the president wasn't president where was he? Where was the Supreme Court justice who's supposed to run the trial? I don't know. Where was Roberts? He said it's not a legal, but according to the Constitution, it's not a legal trial. I'm not coming. Well, I'll tell you why it's <laughs> a legal trial was because the majority of the members of the United States Senate said we're going forth with an impeachment trial. And that I'll, isn't my point. My point is this. Mitch McConnell stood at the end of that. Once the voting was done and Donald Trump had been rescued, in my opinion, and seven Republicans had voted to find him guilty. Once all that was done, Mitch McConnell just opened up a great big bag of whoop butt on him. Yeah. He admitted. You know, admitted. Mitch, uh, Mitch and your president, your new president, by the way, I will, He's your pay, president I, will, too. I will pay for that, that beer that I owe you for yeah. over that election. It's going to be a 16 ounce But both of those guys belong there, yeah. in a nursing home. I'm sorry, but neither one of them should be in public service okay. anymore. Okay, wait a second. <laughs> now you're now you're deflecting yeah. again. They both. I, I put them both in so the same. So Mitch McConnell and Donald Trump, or not Donald Trump, because Donald Biden. Trump's only a couple of years younger than Joe Biden. But, but, you know that, right? Yeah. But when he speaks, at least I can understand what he's saying. Well, sure you can, because yeah. it's clear. Yeah. Go cause an insurrection. Yeah. That was crystal now, clear. There's another thing. I think that your the terminology by no means was that an insurrection. Was it a riot? Yes, it was. Was it an attempted coup? uh, It was not an attempted coup. Okay, let me ask you this. Do you believe that that crowd of Donald Trump supporters that that rushed the Capitol, that bludgeoned a police officer, that killed one, and now we've got five dead, that sat there and, and caused all of that physical damage, do you believe if that crowd had gotten their hands on Nancy Pelosi or Mike Pence, they would have killed him? No. They built a gallow out. Yeah. Yeah, they well, built a gallow. Well, well, you and I will both agree on the fact that the people that were in there were 100% wrong, and they were crazy. They were 100% wrong. There's no reason, and there's no reason today, that we should have to have our, a chain link and a, and a barbed wire fence around the Capitol. It's the people's government. Those guys were 100% wrong. We can point fingers all we want, find those people who did it, throw them in jail, and throw every one of them, because they're all on cameras, throw you, them all in jail. I don't care whose side they're do on. Do you really believe that Antifa and Black Lives Matter did this? No, no, no. I believe that they were in the crowd. I believe some of them were in the crowd. And I think that if you dig deep enough, you'll find those names. And if you look on the FBI list, you'll find the, who their affiliations were. Do, do not you, all of them, but they were not. They infiltrated and they were smart. Does it matter to you at all that there was physical evidence 
that the individuals that stormed the Capitol were saying to the security as they were fighting the security that Donald Trump sent us here. Does that matter at all? Isn't that evidence to well, you? Wouldn't, you? wouldn't you say that? How many of them had ever met the man even? Well, they were with him just a couple of minutes yeah, ago. With him, but you and I can go watch him at it and it growing. You know, did I stand and talk to Donald? He says, I want you and you and you to go in and, and raid the Capitol. Well, but if, if I'm sitting next to you in a theater, uh, it doesn't mean we're sharing a box of popcorn when I stand up and yell fire. Yeah. I mean, if I start yelling fire, it doesn't mean you didn't. You, I mean, you probably didn't yeah. know me, but people are going to jump over and they're going to trash the well, place. Only, the only thing we'll agree on, I don't believe that he was, his language was no more ab abrasive and no more insightful than what has been said a hundred times over by the Democratic colleagues that ran against him, that have accused him of nothing for years, and they're going to fight, fight, fight. They're going to take him out in the back alley and beat the you-know-what out of him. That is all wrong. All of that is wrong. And I that agree came with from that. the other side of the aisle. But that wasn't an yeah. insurrection against our capital and our it, government. It was a riot. It was not an insurrection. Uh, they were okay. not going to take over our government. They were trying to take over no, their they government, were not. Al. They, were, they were trying to take over the government. They they said it. They said it themselves. Yep. I mean, isn't their the voice... The American public and the people there would not have allowed a handful of those to think that they're going to take over the I government. never said it was yeah. an insurrection. I said it was an attempted insurrection. It was a riot is it, what it was, and it was wrong. It was an attempted coup of this nation by a president. Okay, let me ask you not this. Not a coup either. Let me ask you this. Do you believe that Joe Biden won the presidency? You know, I believe that, that he won. He had uh, because everything is certified. I mean, you and I have to follow the rule of law. I believe, do I believe that there was problems with the election cycle? I believe that there was. When our, when our election results are going to Spain on a server and coming back, it's 100% wrong. We need to clean up our election process so it doesn't happen again. I could do this all day long. Thanks yeah. for coming in. You bet. Appreciate it. It's always a good debate whenever Al and I get together. When we come back, we're going to talk about Woodrow Wilson. Uh, what was his role when it came to the last pandemic? We'll visit about it right here as we go down the road. Jeez, what a mess. Look at that. There's roof stuff everywhere. It's so embarrassing. Ruins the neighborhood. Come on, humans. Let's get this fixed. Don't let your roof go to the dogs. Call America's best contractors for your free estimate. Need a new woof? After checking with the rest, go with the best. America's best contractors. 258-2412. Online at americasbestcontractorsincorporated.com. Beck Communications is hiring. Beck Communications is seeking qualified candidates for plant technicians in our Wheatland, North Dakota location. Beck Communications is an equal opportunity employer. To view the job details, visit www.beck.coop. To apply, email your cover letter and resume to careers at bechtel.coop. Beck Communications, making connections that matter. In southwestern and south central North Dakota on any given day at any given moment, a Dakota Community Bank and Trust customer is logging in or signing on to do their online or mobile banking. We believe that community banking can blend both the past with down-home customer service in-house and the future with modern banking conveniences and technology for our customers anywhere, like here or here, all while honoring our long-standing tradition of community-first oriented banking here at Dakota Community Bank and Trust. Beautiful day to get out on the course, isn't it, Corey? Without a doubt, Brian. And Scotty here was thinking the exact same thing. There's a lot on the line for him today. He told his friends he's a scratch golfer, but the numbers today suggest otherwise. Ooh, swing and a miss. Looks like he's excited to find that title list. Unfortunately, he was playing with Mojos. Ooh, and a major infraction just occurred. Can we get another look at that? As from my angle, it looks like he's got about a 10, 12-foot putt. Slightly.
The experienced professionals at Superior Glass provide residential and commercial glass installation and repair services in Central and Western North Dakota. Superior Glass is your source for stained glass projects, mirrors, windows, touchless, and automated entry solutions. Stop by and see us at 3323 East Broadway in Bismarck or call us at 701-258-5600. Superior Glass, where you get superior service for less. Bye for now. You know, ladies and gentlemen, it will be taught in classrooms for a long time, for a long time to come, uh, and that is uh, the insurrection, and I'm sorry, I'm going to use that word, the attempted coup of this nation. Now, whether or not you believe that that was an attempted coup, I would suggest you go ahead and ask those law enforcement officers uh, of the U.S. Capitol Police, uh, one of which it cost him his life, others of which, well, quite frankly, I'd make an argument it cost their lives as well. There was a, a law enforcement officer uh, in the last couple days who shot himself on the way to work. He was a Capitol Police officer. He hadn't been able to sleep. Uh, he hadn't been able to do anything. His wife said that he couldn't watch TV, uh, that he wouldn't talk to her. Uh, he just sat there in, in this depressed mode. Well, what do you do? What do you do? That's part of the cause and effect of what those rioters did. Now, I understand this, uh, and I'm not just doing this because Al Carlson's gone. I had this debate with him face-to-face -face, right here as we went down the road. This was not Antifa. This was not Black Lives Matter. That's a deflection. That's a way of just bunching all people together. The only thing I'm surprised in the tactic that Al didn't use was, uh, well, Portland or uh, Twin Cities, those type of things. That's what they're using as another deflection. This was an armed insurrection, armed in many, many ways, uh, with many, many tools, not the least of which was the verbiage in the beginning. Ask yourself how they got there. Ask yourself how they got there. Many of these men and women that went to this rally were sponsored to go to this rally. And when I say Wayne Stengem, uh, North Dakota's attorney general, I mean it. There's an organization that Wayne Stengem belongs to called the National Republican Attorney General's Association. That organization sponsored some of these individuals on a bus to get to this rally. Now, who are attorney generals? If we believe in state rights, which I do, attorney generals are the chief law enforcement officers in those states. So you're sitting there telling me that the attorney general of Texas, which seems to be their leader, who calls everyone, and he called Wayne Stengem before and got Wayne Stengem to throw North Dakota's name behind a state election, talking about state rights, in Georgia. Remember that? And it got thrown out of court right away by a Republican judge. And so Wayne Stengem sat there and threw in with that legal argument and also his organization paid for people to come, along with Mr. My Pillow, And then you had a number of people from local media saying, well, here we go. Uh, we're the ones. We're going to cover this thing from top to bottom. We're going to rah-rah this thing up because that's exactly what they did. They got these people fired up the way they wanted to get them fired up, which was the goal of what to do to get them fired up. And then all heck broke loose, right? This was all timed so that on January 6th, the day that the Electoral College vote was taking place in joint session, the day that, you know what, the process, the process of a transfer of power in this nation, which quite frankly has always gone the right way, smoothly. My party's lost before. My party's won before. But the one thing that happens is the transition, the transition of government happens peacefully. But not this president. No way. Not Donald Trump. He called them all to, the, to D.C. He wanted them there to D.C. He found the individuals that would sponsor getting them there to D.C. He found the individuals that were friends of his in media so that they could support and use things like Black Lives Matter and Antifa to try to cover this thing up. The problem they're going to have 
with the big cover-up, the big strategy is the fact that we're going to find out who every one of these individuals are. Because they wore masks, they think they're not going to get found out. They're all getting found out, many of which have already been arrested. And you know what you hear from them? You know what you hear from them time and time again? You hear from them that they feel they was sent, were sent to the Capitol to do that by the President of the United States. The other absolutely ridiculous argument, the most ridiculous argument that they had was that Donald Trump was not done speaking yet. They went to the Capitol before that. <laughs> I'm sorry, but he told them to go to the Capitol before that. If they're riled up and they want to be the first ones bashing against that door or building that gallow, if they want to be the first ones, you know what? You do pull the pin on the speech ahead of time. They were there at the rally. They heard what the president said. They heard what Rudy, Rudy Giuliani said. They heard what the president's son said. And you know what? They were fired up because they were told what to do, and they went to do it. I am absolutely convinced that if they found Mike Pence, Mike Pence would be dead. I believe that. That's one area that Donald and Trump, uh, Donald Trump and I and, and Al Carlson and I will always agree on. Donald Trump saying, oh, no, no, yeah, 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 you sent them there for that. It was an insurrection. And so here we find ourselves after we find that seven, seven Republican senators, the most bipartisan group ever to vote on an impeachment, seven Republican senators voted to make sure that the president of the United States at the time, Donald Trump, was found guilty and to be gone down in history as saying, I voted. Because here's the thing, ladies and gentlemen, here's the thing. Every United States senator is asked to put their right hand to God. Put your right hand up to God. And when you do that, swear an oath to the United States Constitution. Every senator has done that. What you found out was that only seven on the Republican side actually adhered to it and did what they swore to God they would do. And neither one of those seven were North Dakota's United States senator. When we come back, let's get a chance to visit about the last pandemic and the history of what America has when it comes to Woodrow Wilson and the role that he played in all of that from Andrew Phillips. He's curator and director of museum operations at the Woodrow Wilson Presidential Library. We'll talk to him right after this as we go down the road. Howdy folks, it's the Caroline Cafe. I reckon it's time you'll do for a hearty meal. So saddle up for the day with one of our hay boss and breakfast yeah. homemade soups. Fill your grill, at a salad bar, sink your teeth into our famous Caroline burger and barbecue ribs. Mm -hmm. Top it off with spur rattling pie with a calm roll that's sure to put a smile on even the toughest outlaws. Yeah. Shake the dirt off the boots each night and warm up with the game. Tell them about it, Stacy. I can't wait to see you at the county line. Since opening in Hebron in 1940, Dakota Community Bank & Trust has been your hometown bank. Our mission has been to provide modern banking convenience with old-fashioned hometown service. We've grown with the communities we serve. Through year-round events, countless sponsorships, and nearly 7,000 hours of volunteering each year. Learn more about our 80-year history at dakotacommunitybank.com. Capital City Restaurant Supply is your one-stop shop for quality restaurant products for the large to small kitchens. Commercial grade restaurant and bar supplies, limb game processing equipment, refrigeration, dinnerware, and smallware. We sell everything including the kitchen sink for trusted manufacturers for the chef and all of us. Open to the public since 1971, we are veteran owned and North Dakota proud. Let us take care of your restaurant and home kitchen needs today by visiting us at 1414 Interstate Loop in Bismarck or on the web at CapitalCityRestaurantSupply.com. Jeez, what a mess. Look at that. There's roof stuff everywhere. It's so embarrassing. Ruins the neighborhood. Come on, humans. Let's get this fixed. Don't let your roof go to the dogs. Call America's best contractors for your free estimate. Need a new woof? 
After checking with the rest, go with the best. America's Best Contractors, 258-2412. Online at americasbestcontractorsincorporated.com. Rush hour traffic in North Dakota, it's almost unheard of, though. I'm speechless. It's something you just don't see around here, especially at this hour of the day. Brian, can you see anything from your perspective? Guys, I can. All this traffic is because some doofus drove off the road. Ooh. Well, let's hope you can help them out of there. No. We'll be right back after this commercial break. All right, great job. Yeah, that went very well. This is a real treat for me, and I really appreciate Andrew Phillips joining us. He is the curator and uh, director of museum operations when it comes to the Woodrow Wilson Presidential Library. Let's bring him in. Andrew, good to have you coming down the road with us. Thank you so much for having me. It's a real pleasure. Now, tell people where the, the museum is at. So we are in a small town in uh, northwestern Virginia in the Shenandoah Valley called Stanton. It's got a U in it, but you don't pronounce that. Um, and this is where Woodrow Wilson was born back in 1856. Yeah, and, and we'll get to that in a little bit because uh, it ties into some of what's happening here in North Dakota and part of what is a, a debate. But it, it is Presidential Day. Uh, when you mm -hmm. think of Woodrow Wilson and you think of the role that he played in the government, what's the first thing you think of? He greatly expanded the federal government's role in the, the lives of the American people. Uh, he, uh, through a lot of legislative achievements, created things like the Federal Reserve, the National Park Service. There were a lot of labor laws. The Farm Credit Law, uh, Farm Credit Act, excuse me, were put in during his presidency. Um, the the big obvious stuff are he had a stroke at the end of his presidency and World War One. But uh, his role in changing how Americans relate to the federal government is is a really big part of his legacy. So we're going to get to World War I and the pandemic in just a second. But one of the reasons I'm, I'm curious, I was kind of happy that you said what you said is people confuse where parties are at during that time in history. Uh, because if you look at where when Woodrow Wilson was president, it wasn't that long after the Civil War. And, of course, right. the Republican Party was seen as the progressive party uh, during that era. And if you look at what Woodrow Wilson did, the National Park, well, I mean, you just named some of the things he did. You could make an argument that the Democratic Party then was the party of, of progressives. And I'm, I'm curious your take on that, Andrew. Well, I think it's it, a, a big difference in, in uh, American politics back then is that there were progressive Republicans and progressive Democrats and conservative Republicans and conservative Democrats. The, the 1912 presidential election is a fascinating one. It's the one where... The sitting president, Taft, is running as a conservative Republican. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt is running as a progressive Republican and splits off, forms the progressive Bull Moose Party. And Woodrow Wilson is running as a progressive Democrat, but he's also able to attract a lot of that conservative uh, Democratic support, especially in the American South. Uh, so he is running on a lot of progressive platforms and honestly goes beyond them. He takes a lot of the things that uh, Theodore Roosevelt had said he was going to do and ends up accomplishing them uh, during his presidency. He ends up busting more trusts uh, than uh, Roosevelt had uh, during his presidency. So I, I want to talk to you about how that relates to today, uh, the pandemic that we're dealing with today. That was a hand that Woodrow Wilson was mm -hmm. dealt. Uh, and so let, let's talk about, you know, how these two compare. Give me your take on that. So you're talking about the Spanish flu, 1918 influenza pandemic, rages around the world from the from early 1918 till it's declared over quote unquote in uh, December of 1920 uh, and that is entirely within Wilson's presidency uh, and he doesn't really do anything I mean there are some six uh, 675 uh, thousand deaths 
uh, just in the United States from this disease. And there is very little that the federal government does. Uh, during the pandemic, Wilson and the White House in general, I suppose, issue no statements about the pandemic. Uh, you know, especially in the early months uh, of what we're dealing with now, we were uh, getting daily or at least weekly press conferences from the president, from governors, from uh, you know, heads of the CDC. That's not happening during the Spanish flu. Um, and it's mostly because people weren't looking to the federal government to deal with those sorts of problems. Instead, they were mostly looking to city and state governments because they were the ones who had public health officials on the payroll. Uh, the, the highest paid sort of public health person in the federal government at this time was someone who primarily was dealing with the retirement homes for sailors uh, for the U.S. Navy. Um, they, you know, there wasn't really anyone in place. There was no, uh, there was no FEMA uh, at this point uh, in in the federal government. Uh, and so Wilson uh, thought that his role was. This is in the middle of World War One as well. The United States joins uh, the war about a year before the pandemic starts. Uh, it had been going on for several years before that. Uh, but Wilson saw his role as president of the United States to prosecute the war uh, and to the exclusion of a number of other things, including really dealing with the pandemic. So uh, let me ask you this. Uh, 675,000 was a number that you just uh, I'll, I'll quote you on. What percentage mm -hmm. of the population was that now? Because what people hear 675,000 mm -hmm. and they hear words, well, he really didn't do anything. They're going to say, well, look at what the U.S. did. We did a whole bunch of things at, at a cost uh, fiscally of this amount, and our number is very similar, uh, mm -hmm. you know, currently to 675,000. So it begs this question. What percentage of population of the U.S. was 675,000? Well, I, I will admit I became a, a history person because I am not a math person. <laughs> um, but I can tell you that the, the, the national population at that time was about 100 million. Um, so uh, it was, it's, it's a high number, I guess, if, if, we're, if we're rounding up and saying it was a million. And I yeah. don't think, I think the 675 is, I think, a, a low estimate uh, because that is essentially people who have the flu or specifically uh, influenza-related symptoms as the cause of their death. Um, people in, in rural uh, America who aren't able to get to hospitals, um, aren't necessarily getting included in that tally. So I think the number uh, is a bit higher, not drastically so. Yeah. Um, but we're talking about, uh, you know, uh, almost uh, is just under a million people out of a population of only 100 million. And that is, uh, in comparison, I mean, the, the national population was about a third, a little less than a third of what we have today. Right, right. I mean, we're over 300 so proportion million. Yeah, now. proportionally, we are, we are the, the current death toll is not yet approaching uh, the uh, the uh, Spanish flu death toll, even if the raw numbers, it's it's getting closer. If you wanted to compare the two, just rough math uh, now with what you've given me with the the hundred million, if you wanted to compare the two, you could say that uh, you know that it was one third uh, of what we're really talking about now. We it, not doing anything, we would be times three of what we had. Right. So let, let let me ask you this: Why so long? to get into World War I. Uh, you know, history has asked that question so many times. A lot of U.S. soldiers making their way into World War I through Canada. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, what, what took Woodrow Wilson so long to get in? Uh, well, I mean, there were, there were a number of reasons. Uh, one, of the, one of the biggest is that a lot of Americans saw the war as, oh, so I guess the European royal, uh, royalties uh, are fighting again. This, this guy who's the third cousin of this guy who's the, you know, brother-in-law of this king, you know, that they're just having some sort of squabble. Why on earth should the United States get involved? We, uh, many people left Europe, uh, came to the United States it, specifically to avoid getting involved in European wars. Um, and uh, also, very importantly, there were large demographic sections of the United States uh, who did not have any interest in joining the war on the uh, British and French side. Uh, one of them being uh, German Americans, some of whom uh, at the time there were some 500 uh, daily newspapers still being printed in the United States in German. Uh, that uh, not really, there were some I'm sure who wanted the United States to join the war on the on the side of Germany uh, and the Austro-Hungarians, but 
for the most part, they just didn't want to be involved. They had left these small, you know, German uh, states, uh, prince bishoprics and kingdoms, uh, before the German Empire had had coalesced just just four years before World War One. They had left Europe to get away from that stuff. Yeah. They didn't really want to get involved in it then. Uh, and Irish Americans are were also a very large uh, percentage uh, of the population, especially in very populous northeastern states. Big voting bloc had no desire to help England. They are uh, absolutely uh, have no desire to be helping the United Kingdom do anything at a time when the entire island uh, of Ireland uh, is uh, subjugated by the United Kingdom. Well, you're spot on, right? You're talking about, well, the name Heitkamp. Okay, so that's about as German as you can get. And in, in my family's history, they came down through Canada to mm -hmm. avoid exactly what you just said. I'm just glad that you said it a lot better than I did. Um, <laughs> in, in, the, uh, in the 30 seconds we have left, there's tons of time, why was Woodrow Wilson's widow the first president ever? <laughs> first woman Woodrow, president ever, I'm sorry. Woodrow Wilson had a terrible stroke, a very serious stroke in October of 1919. And for the rest of his presidency, for about a year and a half, he, le he leaves office in March of 21, as scheduled. Uh, his wife, uh, Edith Bowling Galt Wilson, his doctor, Carrie Grayson, and one or two other people had a huge hand in keeping the severity of his condition from not just the American public, but also other people in the government, even in his own cabinet. Um, so she will write later that she never really had much power. She was only deciding when to bring things to him. But when the him in question is the president, that is a lot of power. Um, I think it's probably more fair to say she was the first female chief of staff than first female president. But uh, we very much hope that that is not that's not something that a first lady can just do unilaterally ever again. Andrew, I love the hats behind you. He wore cool hats. <laughs> I will tell you that. Thanks it's for coming. On. coming to you from a museum. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. Appreciate it. Goodbye. When we come back, some closing thoughts here as we go down the road. There's nothing more important than family. And at Prairie Rose Family Dentists, we get it. That's why we have more locations, more dentists, specialists, extended hours, pediatric clinics, and even emergency appointments. So you can always be seen. Book your appointment today at prairierosedentist.com. Prairie Rose Family Dentists. We are family. Deciding how to promote your business can be hard. Visit the professionals at Dakota Promotions and Printing and let them help you through your struggle. Dakota Promotions provides promotional items and apparel from corporate gifts to team shirts and everything in between. With quick turnaround times and friendly service, they are your best choice. And best yet, you're shopping local. Visit them online at dakotapromo.com or stop in their showroom at 320 West Main in Mandan. Dakota Promotions, delivering promotions just for you. Hi, I'm Dennis Haugen, along with my sons Andy and Mike, and we're showing our support for wind energy in North Dakota. Wind energy has provided farmers like us with a steady stream of income that's not tied to the weather, like crops and cattle are. Another bonus is that wind farm owners are required to maintain the roads leading up to the turbines. Because of that, oftentimes, these roads are the best in the county. Wind energy is good for landowners, it's good for the land, it's good for our economy, and it's good for North Dakota. 40 years ago, Aero Service Team started with one truck and lots of hard work. Times may have changed, but the hard work that we put in to get your lives back in order after fire, water, and disaster hasn't. Over the years, we've seen so many families lose their belongings due to water and fire damage. Restoring homes back to the original state has made every hour of hard work well worth it. Thank you for trusting our family with yours. When disaster strikes, you only have to make one call. Arrow Service Team does it all. The experienced professionals at Superior Glass provide residential and commercial glass installation and repair services in central and western North Dakota. Superior Glass is your source for stained glass projects, mirrors, windows, touchless, and automated entry solutions. Stop by and see us at 3323 East Broadway in Bismarck or call us at 701-258-5600. Superior Glass, where you get superior service for less. Bye for now. Now is the best time to plan for your 2021 farm equipment needs. North Dakota-based Summers Manufacturing is currently offering early order savings. 
Take advantage of big savings on North America's broadest tillage line, including the Super Colder Samurai and the innovative BRT Renegade, as well as the best-built, best-backed land rollers in the industry. Talk to your Summers dealer today or go to summersmfg.com to learn more about early order savings available on all Summers equipment. If you were watching the show earlier, ladies and gentlemen, you saw things heat up between myself and Al Carlson. Uh, to me, that's good. That's good governance. Uh, that's good debate. It's spirited debate. Uh, we can shake hands when we leave. We can smile at each other when we do it. And we don't have to hate each other uh, while we're doing it. That's, to me, the key to good governance. Uh, that's what needs to happen. You know, everybody's saying that Joe Biden, unity, he promised unity. You know what? Unity only works when you can. And I'll give you a perfect example of that. If Joe Biden isn't able to get his stimulus package through, then you got to find a way to get it through. And if that doesn't mean you did the kumbaya, so what? You've got to get it through. Uh, that's been proven through history. Look what happened with the Affordable Care Act. Many of you saying, oh, you don't like the Affordable Care Act. For how many years? The Republicans had the Senate, they had the House, and they had the presidency. And believe me, look at what they did with the Supreme Court. They didn't need a supermajority to get those Supreme Court justices on. Agreed? And so to repeal and replace the, uh, the Affordable Care Act never happened. It never happened, which tells me one of two things. Either they didn't have a plan, meaning Donald Trump didn't, as he said he would, or, or they didn't have the votes. They didn't have the votes to repeal it. So after all these years, something that the Republican Party says they rammed through, they rammed that through on us. You know what? When they had a chance to repeal it, they didn't repeal it. And so for all those millionaires that serve, all those millionaires that serve in the United States Senate, if they don't want to vote for 1400 bucks going into the common person's pocket to help with this stimulus package, shame on them. Because it's pretty easy when you're sitting there on that yacht or sitting there checking out that bank you own to not give the money to the working man. But they should. Good riding with you, folks. We'll see you next time.